And may I say the warmest welcome. You have arrived at a very special Pea Green Boat Day today, live from the Missoula Public Library. Yeah, I am looking out and seeing and talking to so many wonderful faces and making new friends. And just past this crowd of kids and parents. I am looking across our big backyard that is Montana, and I'm talking to all of you out there too who are listening at your radios and in your cars. And I have to say, whether you are in your cars or your homes or you're sitting here in front of me, I want to say welcome to the Pea Green Boat. Now, I have a little Shel Silverstein poem for us to invite us in. You know how I like a Shel Silverstein poem. Here is my poem of invitation to you from our friend Shel. It says, if you are a dreamer, come in. If you are a dreamer, a wisher, a liar, a hoper, a prayer, a magic bean buyer, if you are a pretender, come sit by my fire, for we have some flax golden tails to spin. Come in, come in. We are a show for the young and the young at heart. And I think it is so special that we are doing this show right now at a library. I'm gonna tell you a very true story. When I was young like you, I lived in a very small town in western Nebraska, and it didn't have much. But I remember my mother bringing me to the library. It was very small, but I remember opening those doors and walking in. And do you know what I remember? The smell of books. That's what I remember. And I remember walking in and feeling like I was amongst my friends. Those books, isn't that silly? But that's how I felt. And I hope that you always feel that same way walking into a library and coming here where the stories live. I'm going to say one thing to all of you before we move on. I want you to, whether you're here in front of me, to take your hands and put them up like this. And I want you to put them over your hearts. All of you out there listening in the radio world do the same. This, friends, are where the stories live. It's where you keep them. We keep them safe and you bring them here to the pea green boat. This will always be a place where your stories are welcome. All right, so we are so grateful now to be joined this hour by the eminently talented Josh Farmer. Yeah. Josh has prepared a potpourri of music for us and will now share a couple of songs. Take it away, Josh. Thank you, P. Greenboat, for having me. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Help me out. Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in the neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say 
Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Thank you for joining me, everybody. I'm so happy to be here on the pea green boat. But I need your help for this next song because it's a little silly and I feel like it's easy to be silly if you have friends to be silly with. So I'm gonna teach you the words to this song. It goes, I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. That's the whole song. Okay, but we're gonna change it up as it goes. Are you ready? Here we go, help me out. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Okay, we're doing it normal. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Nice, you sound good. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Okay, you at home too, I want you singing along with us, all right? So now we're gonna change it up. We're gonna say eight apples and bananas. Are you ready? I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Oh, that's just silly. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. You got it. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Okay, now, eat. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Oh, my God. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I can't hear you. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Woo, you sound good. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Okay, now it gets a little sad because the banana has turned brown on the counter. I like to oat, oat, oat. Opals and bananas. Oh no, not a brown one. I like to oat, oat, oat. Opals and bananas. I like to oat, oat, oat. Opals and bananas. I hope it's yellow. I like to oat, oat, oat. Opals and bananas. Last chance, regular. I like to eat, eat, eat. Apples and bananas. Really? Apples and bananas? I like to eat, eat, eat. Apples and bananas, me too. I like to eat, well, eat, eat. Apples and bananas. I like to eat, eat, eat. Apples and bananas. Give yourselves a round of applause. Yay. Great singing. And thank you, Josh Farmer. There's something about really hearing music in the room, and I was inspired to tell you a story today, okay? It is called Filling the Room, and it sounds something like this. Once upon a time, there lived a farmer, and he had three children. They were adult children, two boys and a girl. Now, the farmer who was getting on in age knew that he wasn't gonna be able to take care of the farm forever. And so he wanted to leave the farm to one of his three children, but he loved them all equally, and he didn't know which one to leave the farm to. Hmm. So he came up with an idea. And his idea said, I'm going to create a contest for them. So he gathered the children together for him, and he said, I want you to listen to me. This is your contest. I'm going to give each one of you a little bit of money, and then I want you to go into the marketplace, and I want you to find something that can fill this room. And whoever can fill this room the longest will inherit the farm. They thought that wasn't a bad idea. So the oldest son went to the market first. And he looked around and he looked around and he had an idea. He saw a lot of feathers, a big bag of feathers. So he bought the big bag of feathers and he brought it home and he sat it down in the middle of the living room and he opened the windows and there was a strong wind blowing and he opened the windows and you know what happens when the wind meets feathers? 
whoosh, 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 those feathers blew around and around and around them. It must have looked amazing. And they floated around for quite a while, almost an hour. But after a while, the wind died down and the feathers fell to the floor. Well, that wasn't bad. But the second son was his turn now, so he took the little coin that his father gave him, and he went to the market, and he looked around, and he looked around, and he had an idea. He purchased some candles, and he took the candles home, and he set them all up. He closed the window, <laughs> and he lit all the candles. And those candles, they burned for hours must have looked so beautiful, the flickering light and the shadows dancing on the walls. But after a few hours, what do candles do when you burn them for a long, long time? What do they do? Ooh, the candles burned out. All right, not too bad, said the father, but now it was the daughter's turn. So the daughter had her coin, but she did not go to the marketplace. Instead, she went out and she gathered all of her friends and all of the neighbors, and they came and sat in a room. And there, she brought her father in, and she sat him in a place of honor, and she gave him back the coin. And for hours, stories were told, and music was played and laughter could be heard rising up <laughs> into the night sky, and the stories went on all the way till sunrise. And at that point, the father looked at the daughter and said, you, my dear, inherit the farm, for you have filled this room with stories and music and laughter, and that will last a lifetime. Now, you should know to the other two boys, he helped them follow their dreams. One became a doctor, one became an architect, but the sister, daughter, always lived at the farm, always had friends, always had stories, and always welcomed her family home. The end. Good. And now we are going to take a brief break to hear from one of today's sponsors. Do you have a sister or brother who drives you up a wall? Ever wish you could just be rid of them? Well, now that can be a reality with Sibling Gone Spray. Just sneak up behind your older or younger sibling and spray our patented formula onto their back. Watch in amazement as they disappear before your eyes. Then let Sibling Gone do the rest. Your sinister sister will be spirited away through our proprietary quantum compounds and it will arrive safely in a boarding school of your choice. From there, Sibling Gone will send regular letters to your home reassuring your parents that all is well and that your bookish brother is thriving in his new home. So, the next time you get a wet willy, charlie horse, burp and blow, soda explode, a pink belly, knuckle masher, spitball, reach for your can of Sibling Gone and cast your troubles to the wind. Sibling Gone, be brothered no more. Please use Sibling Gone spray responsibly. Sibling Gone cannot be responsible for lost or damaged siblings and cannot guarantee that your sibling will not eventually come back. Yeah, you too at home. Yeah, 
I see skies of blue, well sometimes, not today, and clouds of white, the bright blessed day, and the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, everyone, what a wonderful world. the rainbow so pretty in the sky they're also on the faces of people passing by and I see friends shaking hands they're saying how do you do they're really saying I love you and I I hear babies cry and I watch them grow they'll learn much more than I will ever know and I think to myself a little bit more here. I do want to point out that there has been a couple of introductions that were not made today. Um, sitting back there against that window is someone you love. That is Sam back there. You say hi to our Sam back there. <laughs> Sam is sitting here against a window for those of you that are listening. And someone else is sitting and listening to us right now. Um, she's not here, but she is my hero. She is my mentor. And I have nothing but respect for her and for always, you know who I'm talking about? Our Annie. We love you, Annie. We love you so much. All right, now, you know, given that we're broadcasting from the Missoula Public Library, um, I took the liberty um, of learning some new facts about libraries and librarians. For instance, did you know what a librarian does after they retire? Well, they start a new chapter of their lives. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. <laughs> All right, and now, with the reading of Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day by Judith Vorscht, we are joined by MTPR's artist in residence and host of Morning Classics, Alan R. Scott, with renowned jazz saxophonist, Lauren Stillman. This morning I tripped on the skateboard and by mistake I dropped my sweater in the sink where the water was running. I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At breakfast Anthony found a Corvette Stingray car kit in his breakfast cereal box. Nick found a junior undercover agent code ring in his breakfast cereal box. But in my breakfast cereal box, all I found was breakfast cereal. I think I'll move to Australia. In the carpool, Mrs. Gibson let Becky have a seat by the window. Audrey and Elliot got seats by the window, too. I said I was being scrunched. I said I was being smushed. 
I said if I don't get a seat by the window, I'm going to be car sick. No one even answered. I could tell. This is going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At school, Mrs. Dixon liked Paul's picture of the sailboat better than my picture of the invisible castle. At singing time, she said I sang too loud. At counting time, she said I left out 16. Who needs 16? I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I could tell. Because Paul said I wasn't his best friend anymore. He said that Philip Parker was his best friend. And Albert Moyo was his next best friend. And I was only his third best friend. Hey, Paul, I hope you sit on a tack. I hope the next time you get a double-decker strawberry ice cream cone, the ice cream part falls off the cone part and lands in Australia. There were two cupcakes in Philip Parker's lunch bag. Albert got a Hershey bar with almonds, and Paul's mother gave him a piece of jelly roll that had little coconut sprinkles on the top. Guess whose mother forgot to put in dessert? It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. That's what it was. Because after school, my mom took us all to the dentist, and Dr. Fields found a cavity just in me. Come back next week and I'll fix it, he said. Next week, I'm going to Australia. On my way downstairs, the elevator door closed on my foot. And while we were waiting for my mom to go get in the car, Anthony made me fall where it was muddy. And when I started crying because of the mud, Nick said I was a crybaby. And while I was punching Nick for saying crybaby, my mom came back with the car and scolded me for being muddy and for fighting. I'm having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. I told everybody that. No one even answered. So we went to the shoe store to buy some sneakers. Anthony chose white ones with blue stripes. Nick chose red ones with white stripes. I chose blue ones with red stripes. But the shoe man said they were sold out of blue ones with red stripes. They made me buy plain old white ones, but they can't make me wear them. When we picked up my dad at his office, he said I couldn't play with his copying machine. I forgot. He said to watch out for the books on his desk. I was careful, except for my elbow. He said don't fool around with his phone. I think I called Australia. My dad said, please don't pick him up anymore. It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. There were lima beans for dinner, I shoot lima beans. There was kissing on TV, I oh, shoot kissing. My bath was too hot, I got soap in my eyes, my marble went down the drain and I had to wear my railroad pajamas. I hate my railroad pajamas. When I went to bed, Nick told, took back the pillow he said I could keep. The Mickey Mouse nightlight burned out and I bit my tongue. The cat wants to sleep with Anthony, not with me. It has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. My mom said some days are like that, even in Australia. I think any day is better with saxophone. <laughs> well, this is a, a Shel Silverstein poem that is, that is dedicated to your afternoon snack. How many of you out there like a good afternoon snack when you come home from school? And I bet, just, just, just by guessing, I bet that you like healthy snacks. I bet your mom and dad and your folks make sure you eat healthy snacks. But this was not true for our poem. This is called Peanut Butter Sandwich, and it's from Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. I'll sing you a poem 
of a silly young king who played with the world at the end of a string, but he only loved one single thing, and that was just a peanut butter sandwich. His scepter and his royal gowns, his regal throne and golden crowns were brown and sticky from the mounds and drippings from each peanut butter sandwich. His subjects all were silly fools, for he had passed a royal rule that all that they could learn in school was how to make peanut butter sandwich. He would not eat his sovereign steak. He scorned his soup and kingly cake and told his courtly cook to bake an extra sticky peanut butter sandwich. And then one day, he took a bite and started chewing with delight, but found his mouth was stuck quite tight from the last bite of that peanut butter sandwich. His brother pulled, his sister pried, the wizard pushed, his mother cried. <laughs> the dentist came and the royal dock. The royal plumber banged and knocked. But still those jaws stayed tightly locked. Oh darn, that sticky peanut butter sandwich. The carpenter he tried with pliers. The telephone man tried with wires. The firemen they tried with fire but couldn't melt that peanut, peanut butter, butter sandwich. sandwich. With ropes and pulleys and drills and coil, with steams and lubricating oil, for 20 years of tears and toil, they fought that awful peanut, peanut butter, butter sandwich. sandwich. Then all his royal subjects came. They hooked his jaw with grappling chains and pulled both ways with might and main against that stubborn peanut butter sandwich. Each man and woman, girl and boy, put down their plows and pots and toys and pulled until Carrick. Oh, joy. They broke right through that Peanut butter, peanut butter sandwich. A puff of dust, a screech, a squeak. The king's jaw opened with a creak. And then in a voice so faint and weak, the first words they heard him speak were, how about a peanut butter sandwich? Oh, the end. <laughs> Well, there's a place where the sidewalk ends, and before the street begins. And there the grass grows soft and white And there the sun burns crimson bright And there the moon bird rests from his flight To cool in the peppermint wind place where the smoke blows black and the dark street winds and bends.
past the pits where the asphalt flowers grow We shall walk with a walk that is steady and slow And we'll watch where the chalk white arrows go To the place where the sidewalk ends Yes, we'll go to the place where the smoke glows black and the dark street winds and bend. Past the pits where the asphalt flowers they grow, we shall walk with the walk that is measured and slow. And we'll go where the chalk white arrows go for the children they mark and the children they know the place where the sidewalk ends. To the place where the sidewalk ends. So beautiful. As Josh Farmer and Lauren Stillman, everyone. All right, here is a question for all of you. It's a good library question. Do you know what to do if a dog starts eating your library book? Well, You've got to take the words right out of their mouths. Oh. <laughs> All right, we are going to take another short break to hear from one of our advertisers, but we will be right back. Life can sometimes take over. You've got soccer, piano lessons, the upcoming ice cream social that you want to take Katie Gardner to, but Lloyd Harrington already asked her, and every time you try, your mouth goes dry and your tongue swells up, and it's simply impossible to speak. So who has time for homework and all of that? And even when you do, you know you're not churning out your best work. All those Bs can only add up to a safety school. What's a kid to do? Enter Pup Professor. Our pack of purebred puggles have been trained from birth by Tibetan monks to consume homework of all sizes and subjects. They are fed a strict diet of the finest, organic, unbleached 80-pound A4. Every day starts with rigorous physical and mental training in order to hone their skills. These professional pooches will ingest nearly every part of your school project, leaving behind one slobbery scrap as evidence you can show to your educator. This time, you can say my dog ate my homework with confidence and get that extension you desperately need. The sky's the limit. Today may be history, but with Pup Professor, tomorrow will be Harvard. When homework's tough, just hit us up. Your furry, friendly Pup Professor. everybody. It is time to strap in for today's Pea Green Boat radio drama. Now we're all going to need some help from the audience, both here and all of you listening out there, all right? We're going to need your help with our story today. So what's going to happen is one of our cast members is going to hold up a sign that says rain. Now, they're holding it up now for, out, for those of you listening out there. And when you see it or hear it, I want everyone to pat their legs like that. Oh, see, it sounds like rain. Now, what does it sound like if suddenly it becomes night? Right? Oh, the night sound sign is up. And if you are at home listening, we want you to make sounds of the night. Owls and crickets and frogs. You can join us, all right? Every creature of the night. All right, now finally, finally, this last cue is called growing sounds. And I want you to sing from the lowest you can, like this. Ooh. And it comes up higher and higher and higher and higher. And when the sign goes all the way to the top, you stop. 
Now, if you're at home, you can't see our sign, but you can hear us, and you can join us. We'll do it nice and loud so you can hear us. All right, so don't forget about all of that. We are now going to welcome our pea green boat performers and a performance of Jack and the Beanstalk, which is a royalty-free play by Ruth Landown Gio Giardon, Giardona. It's a good Italian name, which comes from the fantastic collection of plays for kids and teens on Drama Notebook. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack! <laughs> he lived with his mother. Jack and his mother lived on a farm. <laughs> um, actually, it was a very small farm. Meow, <laughs> meow. <laughs> the fact is, they only had one cow. <laughs> and every morning, while he was trying his best to sleep late, he would hear... Jack! Yes, mother? It's time to milk the cow! Yes, mother? So he did. <laughs> and Jack! Yes, mother? Take the milk to market! Yes, mother? Every day, Jack took the milk to sell at market. Now, at the time our story takes place, in the place where our story takes place, there was drought. No rain. And famine. No food. And general malaise. No fun. The crops were not plentiful, and the animals were not fat and healthy. <laughs> One morning, Jack, it's time to milk the cow! Jack went to milk the cow. But she was not fat and healthy, and she gave very little milk. Jack? Yes, mother? It's time to sell the cow. Take her to market and see that you get no less than five dollars for her. So, Jack took the cow to the market. Along the way, he saw a stranger walking toward him. The stranger walked with a limp. And a cane. <laughs> Hello there, Jack, said the stranger. Where are you going with that cow? My mother says I must sell her at the market for no more than, no, that's not right, for no less than five dollars. She does not look well. <gasps> I know, I'm afraid she's not worth much money. Tell you what, I'll give you something for her. You will? More than? No. I mean less than five dollars? No, something worth a lot more. The stranger opened his hand and showed Jack magic beans. Beans? Magic beans. The stranger reached into his pocket and pulled out five large beans. He gave the beans to Jack and took the cow's rope and led her away. And Jack ran home to his mother. See what I got for the cow. Magic beans! Beans! These aren't just any beans. They're mad. Now before he could finish, Jack's mother snatched the beans out of his hand and threw them out the window where they hit the hard, dry ground. Night fell then. Rain fell. And those beans began to grow. They grew. And grew. And grew. And in the morning, 
Jack woke to find a giant beanstalk growing right outside his window. Wow! Now, Jack just naturally wanted to climb that beanstalk. So he climbed. <laughs> and he climbed. And he climbed. <laughs> until he reached the top. Whew. When he got there, he could hear a sound. A very large sound. It was coming from a very large house. Jack tiptoed up to the house. He looked inside and he saw a giant. <laughs> The giant was fast asleep at his table. On his table were stacks and stacks of silver coins. Jack wanted that silver. He opened the window. He crept up towards the table. He tripped. <gasps> oh no! He fell and woke the giant. The giant hated to be awakened from his nap, and he pounded on the table, spilling silver coins all over the floor. Jack scooped up the silver and started to run. And the giant ran after him. He ran back to the beanstalk as fast as he could. And the giant ran after him. He climbed down the beanstalk as fa fast as he could. And the giant climbed down after him. When he got to the bottom, he grabbed an axe and... Uh, uh, he chopped down that beanstalk. While the giant was still on it. And when he fell, the silver fell with him. It positively rained silver. We want to thank all of our players for that. Uh, Josh Farmer, thank you for all of that. Uh, and I need a list of names. Here we go. Yes, a big hand for the Pea Green Boat players. That is Jake Birch, Chase Campbell, Howard Kingston, Michael Marsalik, and Keith Suda. And now, oh, and Josh Farmer. Don't forget to thank Josh Farmer, ladies and gentlemen. So great. And now we're going to take one last break to hear from one of our sponsors. Every day on dinner plates in households throughout Montana, children are being fed bitter, calorie-poor foods. Many times these children are being refused the essential nutrients they need until they eat so-called grow food. It is time we address this crisis. It is time we eliminate greens from our salad days. It is time to abolish broccoli. I used to love to eat dinner, but then my dad said I had to eat something other than mac and cheese. I would have been open to a lot. Grapes, watermelon, noodles and butter, frosted flakes, but he said it had to be grow food and piled a heap of steamed broccoli on my plate. When I refused to eat it, he said I couldn't have my Halloween candy. I haven't eaten candy since. I insisted on eating nothing but white rice with soy sauce for several months. The doctor said that that's why I got scurvy, but I know big cabbage is in her pocket. Fake news, I say. 
It does not have to be this way. We can live in a world without broccoli. Now is the time. This November, vote yes on Proposition 48, a constitutional amendment that bans coerced eating and entitles every Montanan, regardless of age, to one scoop of ice cream per day. Vote yes. Vote yes. Vote yes. Vote yes on Proposition 48 and say no to big vegetable. Paid for Children Against Vegetables and the American Beef Association. <laughs> well, I Izzy Gizmo by don't Pip know Jones. about that. Copyright 2017, published by Peachtree Publishing Company. Read and produced by Jake Birch with help from Aidan McMahon and engineered by Chris Moyes. Izzy Gizmo, a girl who loved to invent, carried her tool bag wherever she went, in case she discovered a thing to be mended or a gadget to tweak to make it more splendid. But the trouble with things that have dials and switches is they don't always work. They have certain glitches. The T. Mendes, for instance, did such a fine job till out popped a piston and off dropped a knob. Then the swirly spag sonic for eating spaghetti turned Grandpa's wallpaper into confetti. The beard-tastic had Grandpa near perfectly styled till the foam overflowed and the clippers went wild. Well, Isabel, who was so clever and bright, would get rather cross when things didn't go right. And she huffed. It's too tough. I've had it. I quit. She kicked her invention and called it a twit. Isabel fumed. Grandpa smiled and chuckled. <laughs> you can't just quit cause that thingy Bob buckled. Now, trust me young lady, sometimes you need to try again and again if you want to succeed. Perhaps Grandpa was right, but still, Isabel sighed. She picked up her tool bag and wandered outside. Kicking the stones on the path as she walked, Izzy jumped at a bump. Up ahead, something squawked. From the clouds, a poor crow had taken a tumble and landed, kapoof, in a feathery jumble. Izzy ran to the vets, but he just shook his head. His wing is too broken to fix, the doc said. Perhaps take him home, and there you could try to teach him to live as a crow who can't fly. Day after day, Izzy thought she had found something fun for her crow to do on the ground like digging for worms and racing fat slugs, hopscotch and hoopla and searching for bugs. But the heartbroken crow simply gazed at the sky as the other birds sang and flew happily by. One night, with the crow in the folds of her sweater, Izzy sighed. Oh, oh, I wish I could make it feel better. I've tried. He won't play. He won't drink. He won't eat. She was so very close to admitting defeat. Grandpa said, Izzy, don't give up on him now. I know you could do it. Just work out how. Then Grandpa passed Izzy her gadgety things, and she knew what to do. I'll invent some new wings. Izzy piled up her books, and she started to read. Then she made a long list of the things she would need. She searched for some batteries and old electronics, dismantling a mixer and the swirly spag sonic. The crow watched, entranced, and he held Izzy's drill while she bent, bashed, and battered, and walloped until... Ta-da! Izzy fastened the wings with a strap, but they hummed and they twitched, far too heavy to flap. Ah! Izzy yelled. I'm no good at succeeding. The crow softly cawed, his beady eyes pleading. What now? Izzy cried. Try again, Grandpa said. Okay, follow me. And with that, off she sped. Izzy dove in a pond where she borrowed a pump. Then she took from an engine two sprockets, a sump. Izzy fastened the wings, they were light, they were curvy. But the wings, the wrong shape, turned the crow topsy-turvy. I give up! Izzy yelled with a furious frown. The crow sadly cawed as he hung upside down. Izzy unscrewed the head from the shower, found special circuits to adjust the wing's power, and finally, using her trusty old pliers, she borrowed the motors from two big blow dryers. Yes, Izzy said. The right shape, 
perfect weight. One wing flapped madly. The crow couldn't fly straight. I've had it, yelled Izzy, heading straight for a bin. But the crow blocked her path. He just wouldn't give in. Izzy twizzled and tinkered, and using his beak, the tip-tapping crow gave the screws a good tweak. Then he loosened the cog from Grandpa's old mixer. You can fly, Izzy cried. Oh, your name should be Fixer. After two loop-the-loops, Fixer came into land and stood happily calling upon Izzy's hand. You tried very hard, Grandpa said, and succeeded. You kept at it, Izzy. You did what was needed. But don't pack your tools up. Your day's not quite ended. A few things around here now need to be mended. MTPR Kids. Montana Public Radio brings you children's programming six days a week. Listen to The Pea Green Boat with Vicki at 4 p.m. weekdays and The Children's Corner with Sam Saturday mornings at 8 a.m. Songs and stories for the young and the young at heart. mtpr.org slash kids. Well, we have so many people to thank for today's show and none of this would be possible without the support of this wonderful community resource, the Missoula Public Library, the best library in the world. Thank you also to uh, Celia Avila, the library's community engagement specialist. Thank you for all your help. Hey. Thank you to our stellar performers from the Pete Rebo Players. We have Jake Birch. Chase Campbell, Howard Kingston, Michael Marsalek, Ellen R. Scott, Keith Suda, Nicole Wolcott, and live music today was made by Josh Farmer and Lauren Stillman. Chris Moyles was our engineer and mixed this program. Thanks to our development team for their support, Jess Walter, Suzanne Grist, and of course, Katie Wade, without whom none of this would have been possible. Thank you to MCAT, Missoula Community Access Television, for awarding us a grant to record and stream this program. Today's show was written and directed by Jake Birch, our audio production manager. I am Vicki Cheney. We are wishing you fair winds and following seas. Until the next MTPR Kids and the Pea Green Boat. And as we are signing off today, we are leaving you with one of our favorite songs that we love so much on the Pea Green Boat. And we are going to invite you to dance if you want to. I know what you like. If you're at home, I want you to stand up and get ready to dance. Is everybody ready? Nora, Nora. Let's, let's sing a little. Thanks for joining, everybody. We'll be back again uh, tomorrow. Bye. about you.